in the name of the church in serving others, please drop one of the salty fish also into the offering plate. And there are offering envelopes if you need them. Communion is next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, and the Good Samaritan Fund provides temporary assistance to those in our church and community who request help with needs such as food, housing, utilities, etc. Next Sunday during communion, there will be an opportunity for you to contribute to this fund. Wednesday night dinners. Please join us every Wednesday at 5.30 for our Wednesday night fellowship dinner. Sign up in the Narthex or call the office by noon on Monday. The cost is a suggested donation of $5 per person or $20 per family. You can't get that meal at a restaurant. I can tell you sandwich is close to 10, and this week's menu is a roast pork, rice with tomato gravy, black-eyed peas, and we're still trying to decide on the dessert. So that will be a surprise on Wednesday night. The coffee bar, stop and be crowned in faith between 9.45 and 11.15 on Sunday mornings. Thank you to the volunteers who have been running the coffee bar. And at this time, we still need volunteers for the month of September. August is covered and October is covered, but we need someone to fill in. There's directions at the coffee bar. One of us knows how to work. We'd be glad to show you what to do. And if you are interested, please call Kathy or call the office. Quarterly Church Workday. Please mark your calendars for August 7th. Save the date and plan to be there, or you can bless the crew with a lunch donation. Do you have any hidden talents, such as roaching control, attention to detail, or talking? More details are to come. Did you recently replace your iPad? Do you have one that you don't really use? We are seeking two iPads to help with our worship service. One will be used to run the program for our new live stream camera, and one will be used to program background tracks that we are purchasing to help out the praise band. If you have one you're willing to donate, please let the office know. Thank you very much. And while I'm on the topic of praise band, uh, we have a couple folks in the praise on the praise team are having birthdays this week. Summer will be turning 12 on Thursday, and Jimmy's birthday is Friday, and I'm not going to mention the age, although I know it. And we also 26. have a couple others. 26. Bob will be 26, and Pat will be 30. Carlson is hiring. If you or anyone you know is interested in any of the following positions, please contact the office for a job description and an application. Some part-time positions may be able to be combined to a full-time position. And if you look at youth and children's director, traditional worship leader or choir director, contemporary worship leader, video tech, and nursery worker. The Damascus the Disaster Committee is seeking volunteers. The Disaster Committee is putting together a list of volunteers who can help pre and post storm in the event that LaBelle is hit with another hurricane. If you would be willing to hang up shutters or fill sandbags or make phone calls or clean up limbs or there are many areas where you can need help. You are also look, we are also looking for people who think they may need help from others before or after the storm to sign up in advance. There are forms for those that need help and a sign-up sheet for those willing to help in the narthex. And now it's time for you to greet your neighbors. Hey, Marilyn.
And I'd like to invite Bernice to come down, and while she's doing that, if you could turn in your hymnals to page 34. Bernice is going to be joining our church today. Bernice and I are friends. We've known each other for a number of years. She is also a Stephen minister, um, so she'll be joining our Stephen ministry um, ministry. And when people join the United Methodist Church, even if it is from transfer of another United Methodist Church or another denomination, we do ask for the renunciation of sin and the profession of faith. It is a renewal of our faith when we join a new church. So Bernice, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? There you go. And if you would turn over uh, to page 38. There is a response that we make <clears throat> for Bernice. As members of Christ's Universal Church, Bernice, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministry? And as a member of this congregation of Carlson Memorial, will you faithfully participate in the ministries here with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And then let's uh, join together where it says commendation and welcome. Members of the household of God, I commend Bernice to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. Let's join together in our response. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that Bernice and George are a part of our church family and that we continue to help each other be guided and directed by your loving Holy Spirit. And we ask that you watch over them both and continue to bless them with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you can applaud.
God Almighty.
the ushers to come down. Let's join together in our prayer of preparation that is printed in your order of service. Let's join together. Lord, may you dedicate our gifts to the work of caring and compassion in our neighborhoods and throughout the world. Through our time, talents, gifts, service, and witness, may Christ dwell in our hearts, not for an hour on Sundays, but every hour of every day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on up. Amy, I'm going to hand you this. Can I trust you with the microphone for a second? I got to go get something. Are you done with the lesson already? Did you teach them? No? All right. Well, this, what is this? 
What is this? Has nobody ever seen one of these before? Chicken coop. It's a door to a chicken coop? That's a large chicken. No, 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 this is just regular door. Somebody at 249, I'm guessing, Campbell Street, is probably upset right now. But this is a door. Why in the world? Where did I even find a door? Why do I have a door? Why do you guys think I have a door? That's a great question. Anybody? What do you do with the door? You open it. You just open it? So if you go to a friend's house, you just open the door. It depends on the friend, right? What do you do? What do you do? You knock. Why don't you knock on this door? Knock on it. Oh, come on. How am I ever going to hear you? Why am I going to hear you? Knock. Yeah, it is hard. You want to knock on the door? Oh, that's good. That sounds like a good knock. So what happens after somebody knocks on the door? You just pretend like no one's there? What? Someone comes to answer the door. Someone comes to answer the door. Do you ever say, like, who is it? No. Stranger danger horse. All right, so we just hear a knock and we open up the door. No, it's who? Right, we go. Oh, and this one's really easy to look through, right? So you look through it, and or you can say, who is it? And then the person normally responds, right? Well, a lot of times, we hear this in the Bible, because it's in there a few times. It says, ask, seek, and knock. And ask, and you will receive, all right? Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. And a lot of times we use that only towards God. It's like, God, I just, I mean, I've been wanting this new job. Oh, my knuckles hurt so bad just from knocking. God, give me this new job. God, give me this, uh, uh, you know, this new, um, I don't know, I don't even know. Uh, give me this, this new lease on life, Lord. Give me this new outlook. Give me this uh, rest. I need rest. Or give me more time. God, why aren't you answering? Why aren't you answering? Okay? And we do that to God a lot. And he knows that we're knocking. He knows what we need. And he is gracious. And he will answer. But sometimes we get so busy knocking that we're like knocking on the back door. And guess what? God's knocking on the front. Okay? Luke, it talks about ask, seek, and knock. But in Revelation, the Lord switches it around. And he says, here I am. Here I am, and I am knocking. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and I will eat with, we will fellowship, and we will be together. So a lot of times we think that we're the ones that have to knock, and we should. But God is saying, look, Jesus is also sitting there knocking at your door, and we already know that we don't just let somebody knock and knock and knock. That's rude. And not only that, in, in the chapter, in, in chapter 3, when Jesus is saying this, it's funny because he goes to the extra mile and he says, if you hear my voice. So he's not just knocking. God's not just knocking there. He's saying, hello, this is who I am. Let me in. Why aren't you letting me in? Right? So we know who's there and we still let him knock. And wouldn't it be silly for me to walk around my whole life with this door? It'd be really inconvenient. It'd be really hard. I'd probably make a lot of new friends or at least get to meet new people because they'd ask me what's going on here with the door. And it's a good icebreaker. But you don't want to walk around with this. It is, it is misleading. So if we're walking around with this door, if we're not letting God in, that's all we're doing. God's knocking on our door. Hey, let me in. And if we're not answering him, if we're not letting him in, we're just carrying this around. This is a barrier between us and him. All right, there's a parable too that says, you can wait too long. God's gonna knock, but there's gonna be a time when the knocking stops. And those that were called, those that were invited, they go in. And those that didn't answer, he says they're going to be knocking, begging, begging, begging to be let in. And God's going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't let you. Now, I know we're not all perfect here. That's why we're here. I'm going to say that again. I know we're not all perfect here. And to follow in the tradition of the Bible, I'll say it a third time. I know we're not all perfect here. So we need to open the door up. We need to open the door up. So what is a door in your life? Because I know that there is. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's pride. There is a door in each and every one of your lives, in my lives. It seems like I'm at a door factory sometimes. And there's doors in each of your lives too. That God's knocking at right now. Stop walking around with the door. 
open it up, let them in. The worst he can do is tell you you were wrong, which is what we all are. And then, hey, this is how we're going to fix it. All right, that's about all I got, man. That was a good one. So let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we'll go do a cool crap with some birds. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that this door was out in the shed. I was hoping that there would be a door out there so I could do this lesson, and there it was. So um, thank you so much for that, just these little things, Lord. But no, I, I hope that everybody here remembers that it is as silly as us walking around with this huge door whenever you, the creator of the universe, Lord, are knocking at our door saying, let me in. And Lord, we're just ignoring you, doing our own things, busy in another room. Lord, let us have the wisdom to open up that door and to not put it off for another day because we know that tomorrow is not guaranteed. Lord, we thank you that there are so many that have entered through that door, that your son has opened us up to that possibility and has graciously given us that key to heaven, Lord, that we can be called co-heirs, that we can not just have a place at the table, but Lord, like have a place at the table of God the Father and all. So let us not ever lose sight of that. Let us answer that door. We get so upset when God doesn't answer things how we want him to. Lord, we read a lot in the Bible about how God gets upset at us for not listening. We need to be reminded of that. He loves us, but he also rebukes us. Lord, so if now's a hard time in anybody out there's life, in any of these kids' lives, because God's knocking on that door, just give them the strength to open it up and let them in and see what God has to tell them. Jesus, and we pray. Amen.
seed that has been planted and a very small shoot that begins to grow before we are even aware of it breaking fruit. And so we thank you for your continued care of us. Help us to pray also for our nation, our world, and all the people in it. We pray for those who are still struggling with COVID, its infection, and its disruption, and the grief that it causes. And we ask that you continue to strengthen all people. Help us to be a church that opens doors, that continues to be open to those around us. When people ask, can I come in, will I find a welcome? We say yes. Because as we show the way to an open door, we show the way to Christ. We thank you for your presence this day and always. And as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, help us remember that this prayer is said around the world, in many languages, in many countries, and yet we say it together as one family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And you may notice in our order of service, it has two different page numbers because we have two different printings. So it's either found on page 67 or page 72, depending on which printing you are using. And it is the story of Mary and Martha, which may be familiar to some of us. Now, as they all, the disciples and Jesus, went on their way, Jesus entered a village where there was a woman named Martha who welcomed him into her home. Martha had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God add his understanding to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Have you ever felt that someone just doesn't measure up? Sometimes that happens in business. They just don't quite measure up to the expectations of the job. Have you ever felt better than anybody? Maybe you've felt worse than most. I have a friend of mine who struggled a lot with the story of Mary and Martha because it feels very divisive when we first read it. Martha's not the spiritual equal of Mary, but there's background here that helps us understand what Jesus is talking about. Jesus and his disciples have come from Judea, have come to Judea from Capernaum, and Jesus goes to Martha's house, and we meet Mary, her sister. And then we're told something really, really interesting. It doesn't always get translated, however, into every scripture. And the one that I just read actually leaves it out. This is the literal translation from Greek. Martha had a sister, Mary. Mary also sat and also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Mary also sat at Jesus' feet. This 
changes slightly how we look at this scripture. Martha and Mary had both been sitting, listening to Jesus. And then what happens when people get together? We're Methodists, we know. We eat. That's what we do. Well, we do other stuff too, but we love a good meal. And so people get hungry. And Martha is a caring hostess. She wants to provide for her guests. And so she gets up and begins to do all the food preparation. And so Martha is working at getting the food ready and Mary continues to sit listening to Jesus. Then we have a little sibling moment. Anybody have siblings? Have you ever had a sibling moment? My sister and I had one in the car. We decided to argue about how many Kleenex were left in the box. My mother actually opened the back door and almost said, get out of the car, girls. I'm leaving you here. No. Huh. Yeah, for 45 minutes we argued about how many Kleenex were left in the box. Boy. Martha gets, as the scripture describes it, distracted by much service. Now the word distracted literally means to be weighed down and to be driven mentally. You got too much on your mind. Too many things are happening. She is weighed down by all the details that have to occur. And then she comes into the room to complain to Jesus that her sister's not helping. Have we ever been weighed down or distracted by too many details that we have to keep track of? Have we ever been weighed down by life, by struggles, by illness, by responsibilities? I think most of us have been there at one time or another with or without the sibling part. We just have too many details to keep track of. We even have an expression for it. My mind is racing. Do we always succeed in everything we do? No. Do we always do things with a cheerful, charitable, and grateful heart? No. Do we devalue the work that we do because we get distracted and burdened? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I read this during the week. How often do we find ourselves running so hard after God, trying so hard to please God or please others, giving everything we have to see that the work gets done and finding at the end of the day that the joy we feel is out of reach. Rather than fulfillment, we feel only stress and despair and we take that same idea of excessive val val valuation or devaluation and we break our hearts with it over and over and over again. A full calendar equals God's love. A not full calendar equals you're basically lazy. I think Martha gets a bad rap here and I think sometimes we have looked at this scripture in a way where Martha gets a bad rap. Because sometimes we devalue the work and the ministry that we do because we are detail-oriented. We need to listen to Martha. Sometimes service isn't easy. There are details that need to be attended to. And the part where I think we really have a problem with this parable is the next bit, where Jesus says, <laughs> Mary has chosen a better way, or actually it literally means a good portion. What is he talking about? What does he mean? I think Mary also gets kind of a bad response in this parable too, because Mary doesn't strike me as someone who just kind of sits around and, you know, goes, la. Oh, no. 
man is perfectly spiritual 100% of the time. Our busyness and distraction often comes from the noblest place of our hearts. We want to provide for our families. We want to give our children every opportunity to enrich their lives. We want our church to grow and be fruitful and multiply. We want to serve the Lord. Where would the church be without the faithful folk who perform acts of hospitality and service that's so vital to making a church welcome? And yet, if all of this activity leaves us with no time to be in the Lord's presence and to hear God's words, then we're going to end up kind of anxious. And we will burn out. There's a balance here. We need to remember to breathe deeply, trying to serve without being nourished by God's word is like expecting a fruit tree to grow when it has been uprooted. Here's the thing we need to remember, the Lord loves us no matter what. The Lord loves us unconditionally and the love of God is not contingent on our productivity. Now that doesn't mean we don't do the work, but we can't work harder or faster or better to earn God's love and Christ's forgiveness. It just doesn't happen. Amen. I love this story. It was a Christian education committee, and they were responsible for the Easter breakfast on Easter Sunday. And they went whole hog into the Easter breakfast. They had eggs and bacon and pancakes and grits and biscuits and cereal and oatmeal, and they found it difficult. By the time they got to Easter worship, they were so exhausted they could barely focus on anything that happened in the worship service. So they did what any good church committee does in that case. They passed it on to the Congregational Care Committee. And they said, you guys love to serve people. Breakfast is yours. But the Congregational Care Committee found it also difficult. They couldn't keep it up. And they said, we're having exactly the same problem. We're coming into Easter service and we're snoozing in the pew because we're so tired we can barely keep our eyes open. They actually wrote about this in a little devotional book. I love the story. They said, we learned we needed to change something. So we decided to do that, and we had pastries and coffee that people brought in the day before. Freed from distraction and preparing many things for breakfast, we were able to enter Easter with a joyful heart. We are both Mary and Martha. We really are. It's not one or the other. It's both and. And we need to balance them both. I remember a church I was serving. We were having a anniversary celebration. It was a big one. And so we decided to invite this big choir to come. You know, they came in buses. We had to put them up. We had to feed them. We had reservations for the worship service. We had so many people reserve the seat for the celebration. We couldn't fit them all in the sanctuary, so we had to get an overflow room. And that's just where it started. We cleaned absolutely everything. If it was stationary, we cleaned it. If it moved, we chased it down, and then we cleaned it. We picked flowers, we painted landscaping, we planted new plants, we painted things, we repaired stuff. The local press came, the district superintendent came, lots and lots of folks from different churches came, people who had sung in the choir previously came, previous pastors came. Now, I'm in the church about 30 minutes before everything is due to start, and I'm standing in the middle of the... Uh, 
aisle, and I'm walking down the aisle, and all of a sudden, a thought occurred to me. What if nothing works? <laughs> what if the electricity goes off? What if the sound doesn't work? What if the choir falls down the stairs and they all break their legs, all 50 of them? What if the overflow room, the leak happens and, you know, it gets flooded and I just was gone? <laughs> all of a sudden, I see a light person come hurtling down. He came almost to the dead rug because he saw my face. And he got right up in front of me and he said, Pastor, breathe! And then he said, and now we're going to pray. God love him. <laughs> I had a complete moment of total panic because it suddenly occurred to me that something could go wrong. So we prayed together. I took a deep breath, several in fact. And then we were all fine. And I learned something that day. I don't worry so much if something can go wrong now, because I figured we can all get creative, and God has things covered anyway. Amen. But occasionally those moments will come upon us when we suddenly stop in the middle of what we're doing and go, what if something goes wrong? It's a balance we need to remember between Mary and Martha, between the work and the time of listening and prayer. We have some words for those in the Methodist tradition. It's called works of piety and mercy. Piety is basically listening to God. Mercy is serving God. So works of piety would be prayer, worship, Bible study, quietness. Works of mercy would be visiting the sick, those in prison, feeding the hungry, seeking justice, ending oppression. It's a balance that we need, and we don't always get this balance right. That's the truth. We really don't. And so we need people to just come rocketing up to us and go breathe, pray, let God have control. Actually, that works. Breathe, pray, and let God have control. Here's the thing. If we only work without the breathing and the prayer and letting God have control, we're going to run ourselves right into the ground. We are going to burn out, and we are going to have nothing left to give. A family member of mine referred to it as having your debt to society card all punched out. There's just nothing left. And I've seen people in churches get to that point where there's literally nothing left. And they leave. If, however, we only do the prayer and the study, but we don't apply it when we meet other people, it doesn't get very far. It's like trying to get a fruit tree to grow when it's been ripped up out of the ground. We can't do one without the other, however, so. And this seems a little counterintuitive, because this is all supposed to be, you know, very organic and stuff like that, but sometimes we have to literally schedule both. I have learned over time in the ministry that if I don't take time to just be quiet, People start yelling at me in my dreams. Everything just gets louder. And I get more stressed. But if I take time during the day and during the week just to stop, it makes things a lot easier. Now, sometimes you can do that in the morning. I had a friend of mine who was really creative about it. Her job was basically driving. She would just drive from one place to another and, you know, do different things at different offices. And she said, uh, uh, you know, by the time I get home, I'm just like, oh. So she decided every stop, every stop light, she said,
instead of brown. Every one. It's a nice way to relax. Another friend of mine um, would garden, and so gardening time became time of prayer and quietness. Some people like to walk and pray. You know, you walk around the church or you walk around your neighborhood, you take a block. Some folks who work in an office, if you get a chance to go to lunch, take five or ten minutes during that lunchtime and sit in your car if you have to. There are ways to bring that balance into balance. We just have to be aware that we need to do it. And we need to ask daily for help with this because well, some of us are better at it than others, but all of us struggle with it from time to time. Ask daily, God, help me balance today. Help me balance today. Just today. That's all I need to do is today. Help me find some time to speak with you. Help me do the work that is needed to be done. I've seen some of that here, and it's awesome. I love it. You guys are really conscious of this. Starting meetings with prayer and devotionals. Spending a moment, just taking time to focus on what's important. I remember being at annual conference one year. And there was a bishop who was preaching the ordination service. <laughs> he was awesome. And um, he said, you know, <laughs> there is sometimes uh, a tendency in the church to just keep going. Sometimes we just keep going forwards. Sometimes we spend too much time looking in the rearview mirror at where we've been. We need to learn occasionally to stop. There's a book called uh, The Midford Series. Some of you may have read it. I love it. I love the dog particularly in that Midford Series. But I love the pastor in there particularly because every day, and I have to remind myself to do this, but I love the image. Every day, this pastor, before he walks in the church office, prays at the door. I wonder what would happen if we prayed for every door in this church, that it would be open to those in need. Every door. It might take us a little while. There's a bunch of doors here. But every door is open to those in need. Every heart is open to those in need, inside and outside. It's a balance, and we can do it. Sometimes we'll need a little help from time to time with friends, family, church members, prayer and work, piety and mercy. They go together. And once we get good at this and we begin to do this almost automatically, we'll realize something. They're, they've never really been separated. They're just two sides of the same thought. Prayer, mercy. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that we are able to Learn to balance our Mary and our Martha, our work and our spirituality. Help us to do that each day. Help us one day to do it and then the next day. We only need to do one day at a time. So help us continue to balance that between the work and the piety, the mercy and the love of you. So that our hearts and our doors will always be open to each other and to those in need. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is Glorious Day. Boy, somebody 
better know this one. <laughs> They're coming. Oh, excellent. I suddenly had a moment there. It's like, okay, you want me to sing it? I don't know it. But I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate it. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was thrown. 